our belief is that by going state by state, that we can not only create a bulwark of states to protect Bitcoiners and to protect our ability to access the technology, but that simultaneously, if we build that bulwark and that uh, coalition to be large enough, that we can actually impact federal policy. Welcome to the Compass Mining Podcast. I am so excited to introduce my, my close friend and Bitcoin advocate, Dennis Porter, who leads the Satoshi Action Fund. Dennis, thank you for joining me today. Curtis, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yes, it's, it's been great to know you over the years and looking forward to this conversation. Dennis, we have this unique like experience where we both travel around to a lot of conferences and we see each other and are able to engage, you know, friendly and professionally, but I'm really excited. I think this is going to be one of the longest conversations we've, we've had in quite a while because I'm blessed to be able to know you personally. I have a high amount of understanding about what Satoshi Action Fund is. I really actually watched you launch it from the ground up. We, 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 Dennis, we serve, you know, really two primary audiences. We speak, you know, uh, largely to the existing Bitcoin mining industry. And then we also have, you know, 12,000 unique mining customers who are plebs, just like me. They're guys who mine at home, et cetera. So two different audiences, you know, with both of those in mind, would you, you know, even unpack a little bit more lengthy, would you take a moment and, and talk to both of those audiences about who Satoshi Action Fund is and the work that you guys do? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's been great to have people like you along for the ride to see Satoshi Action for the launch and then where it's come to today. Uh, you know, when originally this was all the way going back to, you know, when Dennis was a podcaster and just a Twitter influencer, so to speak. And I started to notice that there was a, a total lack of in interest or engagement from the Bitcoin community and in interacting with government politics. And, and listen, li I, I know, <laughs> know a lot of people don't love to, uh, to show up and, and try to lobby lawmakers or educate lawmakers the way that I do. And so they sort of want to keep a, uh, some distance from, from the political space. And there's this whole idea of, you know, Bitcoin sort of being uh, separated from, from the political space and government. And so I, I understand the ethos of, you know, separating money and state, just like, you know, they ended up uh, doing the same with the church and information and books and being able to read as well. So um, I, I took a lot of work to prove that there was a lot of value in being politically engaged. But ultimately, we, we've been able to do that at Satoshi Action Fund. We're really proud. It started with an understanding that, you know, if we want to see the United States be the best place in the world for Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, that we're going to have to fight for that. I mean, we don't need to look any further than El Salvador to know that it takes political action to really move the country in the right direction. You know, Nayib Bukele has made decisive, you know, decisive actions and made decisions that have resulted in El Salvador being a leader on this technology. And I believe that we can accomplish somewhat of the same uh, path as they have. Uh, obviously, we will have our own path that we go down with regards to Bitcoin adoption. But that is where the ethos of Bitcoin, or as you say, the ethos of Satoshi Action came from, was to protect Bitcoin and make the United States a leader of the technology. Um, initially, I tried to work with a bunch of different groups. Uh, and at the end of the day, I just noticed that my mission and vision needed to be implemented on my own. I found a couple of, of great co-founders and an excellent policy director. And we got to work right away, educating lawmakers, crafting public policy, and starting to attempt to pass that policy into law. So last year, June, uh, after we launched in June of 2022, we moved into 2023 for our first legislative cycle. And, and last year, we were able to introduce our policy in uh, seven different states. And we were ultimately able to pass it into law in Montana and Arkansas. And after that, people really started to see, oh, wow, okay, like, the, you know, Satoshi Action Fund can get things done. They can pass laws like right to mine, which protect the ability to mine Bitcoin, limits various forms of discrimination. And then, um, you know, from there, we've continued to show there are other ways that we can be successful. We launched a research arm, which proves and shows through credible evidence-backed research that, you know, the things that we all know are true about Bitcoin are, are actually possible and are backed up by science, um, the, namely being the ability for Bitcoin mining to balance the grid, the ability for Bitcoin mining to go in and mitigate methane emissions from landfills, from orphaned oil wells, uh, from flared gas. And also the ability for, for Bitcoin as a technology to provide financial services to the underprivileged and to those that are marginalized or traditionally excluded from the financial system. You know, that's a really big part of Bitcoin that I think that we at Satoshi Action want to highlight in the coming years. And, and we're starting to do that with our research now as, as we speak. 
moving forward from that very first successful year, you know, when we were in the middle of the FTX collapse, it was a bear market and everybody was uh, scrambling to survive. We transitioned into 2024 and 2024, we were able to introduce our policy in over 20 states. We launched a number of different initiatives, everything from fighting back against the debanking effort at the federal level to helping state pensions to be able to buy uh, the Bitcoin ETF, and then also passing our new legislation into law. And we passed that bill, which protects not just the rights of mine, but also the ability to self-custody, the ability to run a node, and the ability to buy, sell, trade in Bitcoin and digital assets uh, freely, and that it's protected. Um, that was passed into Oklahoma just a little over a month ago. And now, uh, for the first time ever, Curtis, your, your show will be the very first show where you get the, uh, the breaking news that we just passed that same bill. We, it was signed into law this morning uh, by the governor, governor of Louisiana. So really exciting stuff. You know, that was a lot. I put a lot on the table, but I hope that um, I hope it gives people an understanding of, of just a little bit of what we're trying to accomplish at Satoshi Action. Wow, that that is that is a lot. And I can't believe you snuck some uh, some breaking news into uh, into this conversation. That's impressive. Louisiana is a wonderful state. They're freedom loving people, and and that 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 makes that makes amazing sense to me. You you said many things there that I hope we'll have a moment to come back and and revisit. Like one of them, you talked about launching your research arm, and I know that that's crucial. But um, uh, I want to go back to one of the earliest things you said is, you know, when Dennis was just a, uh, a podcaster and a Twitter and just a Twitter influencer. Dennis, you've been an amazing voice for Bitcoin the entire time that I've really been in the industry. I was paying attention to you when you were, you know, a part of the, the I, I believe, the Portland uh, area, um, uh, you know, Bitcoin meetup scene. You may have told the story before. I've never heard it personally would you take a moment and tell this audience about your your journey in Bitcoin? How, how did you first get exposed to Bitcoin? How did you become uh, the, the orange pilled uh, guy that you are? Absolutely, you know, happy to happy to share the story. And um, you know, really, all just began with a, a friend of mine who he came to me one day and he said, "You know, there's this thing. It's it's uh, called Bitcoin. It's it's perfectly anonymous internet money." And this was in 2017. I hadn't heard the word Bitcoin. Shockingly enough. Hadn't heard the word Bitcoin a single time before. This is the very first time I've ever been exposed to the technology. And I, immediately I was like, that's not possible, dude. Like, there's no way you can have perfectly anonymous internet money. And uh, so I set out with trying to prove my friend wrong. I started studying Bitcoin, reading about it, learning about it. And ultimately, I did prove him wrong. We all know today that, you know, Bitcoin is not perfectly anonymous internet money, although there are significant privacy enhancements over the traditional financial system. Uh, but... While I was in there trying to prove my friend wrong, I learned a lot about how Bitcoin operates and how it functions because I was trying to prove that there, you know, that this very technical component of the technology didn't didn't exist. And by trying to prove that it didn't exist, I learned what did exist. And while I was in there, I learned there's some really powerful things about Bitcoin, um, in particular, its ability to provide financial services to folks who have been left out to bank the unbanked. And that's a really powerful uh, that's a really powerful uh, problem to solve. If you have a solution for the problem of the 1.4 billion people globally who are no, who are not currently part of the financial system, who don't have the ability to save for the long term, who don't have the ability to plan for the long term, you're really starting to make a big impact, I think, on not just your own community, but potentially the entire planet. You know, I mean, I always put it this way. Think about it like this. There, there could be multiple, you know, Albert Einstein's out there, the next great inventor, the next great creator, um, the next great thought leader or philosopher in a country where they just don't have the ability for people to stave in a stable currency or uh, use a, a, a well-structured financial system where the banks can be trusted. You know, oftentimes people, when they want to in countries without these types of services, when they want to save for the future, they're not saving in the currency. Like if they want to build a house, they're, build, they're saving in bricks. Right. It's not even, they're not even allowed to save in money. It almost goes back to the stone age of being like a, a barter system, so to speak. So imagine, though, like 1.4 billion people and on average, a, a percentage of that population is going to have an incredible amount to offer to society, whether that be ideas, whether that be inventions, whether that be thought leadership that we're just missing out on. It's at 1.4 billion people of human potential that is totally being untapped and underutilized and are not also on an individual basis able to experience life, I think, the way that, of course, me and you are able to experience it, which is, we, you know, despite the dollar not being as sound of a money as Bitcoin, 
it really it really does allow people to save for the future. The dollar today is the best fiat currency that humans have ever had. And despite the abuses that we see through the financial system, we do see that on average, people with more stable currencies live a better, fuller life and have more access to better technologies. Um, and so I want to see a world where people do truly have access to a money that is that is stable and one that can provide a level of trust when they put their money into a bank account, right? We talked about the other issue. We talked about how you know fiat can be debased and you know they, they can't save in it, so they save in bricks instead. Well, let's say they did have a, a stable currency in a country with poor banking and, and um, poor banking infrastructure. Well, oftentimes in those countries, they won't even put their money into those banks where there's lack of, of good financial structures because either the local government or the local mafia or whoever it be, the power that be, will just pull the money out of their bank account and keep it for themselves. Sure. So it's a truly, it's a truly um, a, a oppressive thing to be in a part of the world where you don't have access to a stable currency or stable financial um, uh, banking systems or banking infrastructure. And I believe that Bitcoin can solve that. And so although I started off with trying to prove my friend wrong, which there's no better way to learn about something than to try to prove someone wrong about it. Uh, you really, really want to learn about it so you can prove them wrong. I, I learned that that Bitcoin can be this tool to solve this global problem, to unlock the 1.4 billion people that have been left out and in the long term, I think, build a better world for everyone. And so that's 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 how I got started in Bitcoin. And of course, I've come to love so many more things about the technology, but that was the beginning of the story. Wow. I'm I really you know, thankful that I asked that. I, I don't know that I had heard any of that before in the past. And uh, it's it seems interesting to me, and I'd like I'd like for you to you, you to comment. It it seems to me that um, people come into Bitcoin in waves, and you know I'm class of 21. Okay, I I bought the top. I could have not paid any more, and I am so thankful to have found it. But then uh, you'll often hear people, you know, the, the next phase right behind that, the earlier adopters were 2017, and then likely it was you know um, you know a cycle before then, um, and. You know, I, I know you don't have a crystal ball, and this isn't a conversation about number go up. But what do you see happening in the Bitcoin ecosystem? Or what's that next wave? Is that right now? Is that 2025? If you're 2017, I'm 2021. What's that next wave look like? Any any thoughts, Dennis? Definitely. Um, I think that we sit on the precipice uh, precipice of another traditional bull run. You know, if if you believe in cycle theory, which I, Cycle theory has continued to be the dominant way that Bitcoin operates. And for those that might be sort of new to Bitcoin, it's you know we all know that every four years the having supply um, that gets that gets minted every year through Bitcoin mining gets cut in half, and so this, the available supply going into the market gets reduced. Now, as we see the um, the subsidy get cut in half every four years, we we you know it's, it's sort of uh, it's going to become more and more apparent that. Cycle theory has a hard time being um, upheld because there's just not that much new supply being added in the first place. So, I, I, but I do think we will experience one last um, traditional cycle, traditional bull run at the at the end of a at the end of a having, and that we're probably about halfway through the experience of of getting to that point where Bitcoin takes off. And what I mean by that is we fully recovered the price. From, from the last cycle. In fact, we beat all-time highs. We're back at all-time highs right now, hovering around in between 65 and 70 on average, between, depending on which week it is. And that Bitcoin as, a, you know, as an NGU technology could explode really quite literally at any moment. Like uh, it could be tomorrow. It could be one week. It could be as late as December or as early as, um, as late as like early next year. But I do think that we are right there and just waiting for this next boom to take off. There is just so much happening behind the scenes. You know, I talk to everybody from the largest exchanges to these ETF issuers to the Bitcoin miners. And although I think everybody is reserved, you know, reserved and ready to take it for the long term, that it's pretty well believed that there's going to be a huge wave of capital entering this space. There already has been a new wave of capital because of the Bitcoin ETF. And I think that's what got us to where we are right now, uh, but we are just getting started. A lot of these, you know, uh, investment advisors, wealth managers, family offices, pensions, they're just now really starting to take a look at this technology. And although we see, you know, states like Wisconsin uh, and their pension fund allocating into the Bitcoin ETF, that's just one of thousands of pensions. And, you know, I was just on a call with one of the ETF issuers 
earlier today and they had talked about how there's like a three month period where there there still needs to be a waiting time for one of these like institutional buyers uh, that is looking at the space, they have to do their due diligence. So I, I do think that we are on the precipice of a new uh, big bull run uh, and that it could happen at any moment, but I'm also patient and ready to, to wait for it if it doesn't happen anytime soon. I think that's how people really need to play the technology. You need to assume that it could go up at any moment, but also plan for it to take years. Mm, that's powerful. I you know, I, I've invested my entire family's future in it. I, I'm 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 all in in Bitcoin. I do I do like the idea that slower adoption allows more friends and family to get exposure to it. Um, you know, at some point, number goes so high that you know it's only the big boys who are able to you know own a whole Bitcoin or whatever the circumstances is. I heard someone say one time, uh, uh, "How many Bitcoins should you own?" And the, the 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 number is n plus one. It's the number you have now plus you need you you need one more. Uh, Dennis, uh, there's a couple things coming up. There's a um, mining disrupts next week. I, I know you're you're going to be there. You're leading that event, and I want to talk about that. And you you also are hosting a fundraiser for Stosi Action Fund. So I've got a couple more meaningful things that I want to talk about. But I want to dive just a, a little bit deeper for the audience's impact, and maybe even for my own understanding. Um, uh, Satoshi Action Fund seems to have most of its traction in a state by state um, legislative accomplishment. You know, you guys, you know, you mentioned 20 plus states and now Louisiana now. Do I have that understanding right? Have you found and what was your mindset around that? Have you found that the, the most opportunity is working on a state by state level? Are you still involved in, in national legislative awareness? Could you talk about state by state versus national and how you how you um, play? Yeah, that's a, it's a really important differentiating factor between what we do at Satoshi Action Fund versus uh, more, you know, the vast majority of the space is that we are a national, nationwide, you know, state by state organization. So typically you either see, you know, folks that are just in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's some great groups that, are, that operate there and they focus on talking to lawmakers about federal policy predominantly. And then you also see these local state chapter type of blockchain councils or Bitcoin councils. There's a really good one in Texas, I think that people are most aware of, which is the Texas Blockchain Council led by Lee Bratcher. Um, that one has been somewhat of a blueprint for how these types of state organizations can operate. We also see a really great one uh, popping up in Oklahoma, ran by, ran by a friend of mine named Storm. Uh, it's the Oklahoma Bitcoin Association. And um, there's many others as well. You know, Dom runs the one in Pennsylvania. You've got Andrew in Ohio. Uh, you got Sam Arms in Florida, but they operate just within those individual states themselves. And so we are sort of um, a combination of the two. We are nationwide um, focused on impacting federal policy and state policy, but really, really, really focused on a state by state basis. So we're not siloed down into a single state itself. Our belief is that by going state by state, that we can not only create a bulwark of states to protect Bitcoiners and to protect our ability to access the technology, but that simultaneously, if we build that bulwark and that uh, coalition to be large enough, that we can actually impact federal policy. Uh, and this is uh, what, where the term like laboratory of democracy comes from. Oftentimes, many of the, the policies that are implemented at the federal level come from the, the states and they come from that laboratory of democracy. As a, as a super quick example, uh, the FDIC insurance, that $250,000 insurance that you have on your individual bank accounts, that idea was not only generated but implemented at the state level first. And then at the federal level, they took notice and said, wow, what a great idea. Let's take that nationwide. And we've seen that time and time again, that has been true. Or let's, let's, let's take a more extreme but more recent, and I think um, – a, a situation that people will have a little bit more context around because they saw it happen right in front of their eye, own eyes over the last, uh, let's see, what, 15 years or so. So in, in 2010, the cannabis industry dramatically changed its strategy. At the time, the cannabis industry was not legalized, not really tr fully legalized in, in many states. Now, there was little spatterings here and there in states like California, um, but it was a federal crime. Um, you could not access banking, and you had really no way to operate a cannabis business in the United States. Well, in 2010, they changed their strategy, and they really started to focus on the states. And they immediately, within two years, went and passed law in Washington and in Colorado. 
it's a really big, big accomplishment that they were able to pull off. They created those, those, um, that bulwark of states where at least there's a couple of places where you can go and you know you can survive and, and thrive. And since then, they've gone on to pass their legislation in more over 75% of the country. So now they started in these blue states, right? And then they now have permeated across the country and into red states as well. And, and because of that, because of that flurry of activity uh, where the states are willing to vouch for this industry, of the cannabis industry, um, now we're seeing the federal government uh, uh, react to that, that outcome. Um, we see them trying to move it down the schedule. There's some that are even talking about decriminalization at the federal level, which is, a, is great to see. And I, that strategy that they implemented, which worked nearly flawlessly, is the exact same strategy that we utilize at Satoshi Action. So uh, we're going state by state. Uh, we started with two states. We passed it in two red states. But now we're starting to permeate out. And we've locked, locked down our fourth state now. Um, all of, again, of the, have been red states to start. But in 2025, and even later this year, to some extent, we will see purple states go, move forward. We're looking at Pennsylvania and Ohio in 2020, end of 2024. Those are purple states. And in 2025, we expect to have our first fully deep blue state with a deep blue lawmaker uh, introduce our legislation to be able to protect the rights the rights of Bitcoiners. Um, so th that's the, nut the strategy in a nutshell. And it's not just us that's taking a look at this and saying that's a great strategy, like people should do that. Um, if you go back and you look at a 2015 Bloomberg article about state activity, they back this up with a study they did. And they ultimately found that when you see a flurry of state activity take place, that federal policy is reacts to that new reality. Even for things like women's suffrage, the, the ability for women to vote, that all happened and occurred because of a flurry of activity at the state level. There are many other issues that have experienced that same exact outcome. Um, and we believe that Bitcoin is on that same exact strategy. Those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it. How, how powerful for you to have recognized from women's suffrage to cannabis that state by state, um, you know, a bulwark is, is, what, is, is, is what brings a, a nation around. I do want to ask about a couple, you know, notable senators in, in a conversation. But before I do, and, you know, maybe a little bit of this is selfish. I'm in Kansas. Um, you know, you know, I think we're these days a, a little bit more of a purple state. And I'll even, you know, I'll share something I heard earlier today, you know, about red versus blue. But I want to ask something specific, maybe for that that pleb minor audience of ours. So, you know, they're 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 one of our customers. They may live in, you know, any of the 50 states across the country. What should they be thinking about about how to get involved in a legislative awareness mindset? You know, do they, do they, do they call their governor today? Do they call their senator? Do they call you? Um, if you're in a state that you're a Bitcoiner, a hardcore Bitcoiner, and you want to see um, uh, your state be part of that, uh, how, how do you get involved? What, what, are, what are, you know, a handful of initial steps you would take to get involved at a local level in your own state? That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, there's a number of different ways that people can get involved. Uh, we offer some of those. We offer some opportunities our, ourselves. You know, back in 2023, we did uh, uh, 700 books were hand delivered to every member of Congress. So uh, some got two, some got one, but and ultimately we ended up 700 books by hand. Um, and, you know, that effort would have never been possible without the help and support of many volunteers. You know, we had about a a dozen plus volunteers just walked the Capitol. Man, our, our calves were uh, were hurting quite expen quite extensively after that walk. I I've never walked so far in uh, dress shoes in my life, so it was a little bit of a rough one. But it was absolutely absolutely worth it. And uh, oddly enough, I, I don't know if I can take credit for it, but I, I hope that I, I played some part. But I recently saw Representative Massey uh, introduce a bill to to def to get rid of the Fed, and he said he based it off of uh, the Bitcoin standard, and that he had. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping somehow we, that our copy of the Bitcoin standard was what played an impact on him uh, introducing that bill because he said it was because of the book itself. So um, opportunities like that do pop up. There will be more opportunities in the future. Uh, we, we highly encourage people to go to our website, satoshiaction.io, and there is a, a tab there to sign up to volunteer. Um, but there will be many other opportunities, opportunities like you know sending letters and um, emails, which we have done multiple times to members of Congress and to local lawmakers to ensure that they um, can help us get our policy moved across the finish line or to maybe oppose a bill that, that we think is bad for Bitcoin. So those opportunities arise. 
Sometimes there's opportunities to uh, testify in front of a committee. Uh, we've had multiple people, I think about a dozen people now, uh, testify in support of our legislation uh, at, a, at a state capitol when, when those hearings take place. So tons of different opportunities there. I think also, you know, from a financial perspective, you know, if you really want to see the work that Satoshi Action is pursuing, if you want to see it continue and for us to grow that work and expand the work that we do, you know, we do look for folks to come up behind us financially and support us. Um, and that's also on our website if people want to look up, look up how they can get involved. And, of course, my DMs are open on Twitter. Uh, if someone wants to have a conversation about how to become really involved with what we're doing, you know, please would love for you to reach out. I read, I read every single one of my, my messages on Twitter. So t the other thing I tell people, too, Curtis, I think which is important is uh, if you don't want to get involved in politics, you don't want to give uh, us support, you don't want to show up to the hearings, you don't want to send letters, you think politics is, is detestable to some degree – I, I tell people there is still a really powerful way that you can have an impact, and that is to go uh, launch a Bitcoin business. That's to go build a Bitcoin business. Because mm. as our economic footprint grows, as the jobs that we provide grow, and as the tax revenue uh, grows as well for this industry, lawmakers will be incentivized to to move the right direction on the technology. And so if you don't want to be involved in politics, I always tell people, uh, go build a Bitcoin business. Dennis, I, I think I wear my heart on my sleeve that I came into this conversation a fan of yours. But when you were when you were talking about the work um, uh, SAF's been doing and, you know, looking into 2025, I just appreciate that you're so forward looking. But then to also hear that, like, you know, two years ago, you were real likely the one to have, you know, taken Representative Massey, the copy of the Bitcoin standard. I, I, I've got it on a wall behind me. I, I think it's in a different stack, but that that is that is that just blows my mind. That does bring up that federal level, that U.S. representative. And again, selfishly, I think I'm going to ask a question about Kansas. But before I do, I want to share a story and maybe give you a chance to a chance to comment. One of the best experiences I've ever had in my life came from something you arranged. I was a part of a group. You had arranged a, an opportunity for Oregon Senator Wyden to be able to sit down with Michael Saylor and to be in the room to watch, you know, I think one of the most vocal ask, you know, uh, advocates for Bitcoin, Michael Saylor, um, to really educate a senator just right across the table. That was an amazing experience. And you arranged that. You gave Massey a book. You helped Orange Pill Wyden. Wyden is one of the largest, you know, freedom, you know, um, uh, advocates that I see. And certainly on that uh, Democrat side of the aisle. Dennis, how do you do that? How do you make these connections? I, you know, I, I think there's more of an art to it than there is a science. Uh, uh, it's just, uh, you know, you know, that's, that's actually a really good question. I don't know if I could, if I could actually highlight, uh, the, the, the steps it takes to, to bring these people together. Uh, maybe it's just a, a natural talent. I'll have to go back and think about it now, Curtis, and I'm not sure if I've had that question before, but uh, it was an exciting moment to, to bring them together. I was able to, uh, have Sailor and, and Wyden and many others in the room uh, sit around uh, at dinner and, and have a great conversation about the potential of the technology. Um, this was just a little bit before I launched Toshi Action, too. So it's kind of like my first uh, true political uh, uh, foyer right into the Bitcoin space, trying to make it, make an impact. So it was great to have you there. I thought it was a fantastic opportunity. And it's definitely a, my my Dennis Porter Sailor Wyden photo is one of my most prized uh, prized photos. So it was uh, it was an honor to put it together. Then, then let's just take a brief moment and pause on that, and I'll, I'll ask Jared to uh, to in include the photo on the on the podcast. Dennis, is there any chance you remember who took that photo? Was it you, Curtis? It Did was you take me. It? 100%. <laughs> I, 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 I it was a great. Uh, it's a great photo. We'll have to. We'll definitely put have to put it up on the screen. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so proud of that moment. Um, we, we talked about, you know, I'll, I'll share a brief story. I was listening, you know, um, uh, Peter and Marty put out a conversation earlier this week on Marty's article about white pilling, and I was able to, uh, to listen to that just this morning. And they named Whiten, and they named Lummis, um, and they talked about, you know, you know, shared some comment about as, you know, it's not red versus blue; it's truth tellers versus. Uh, uh, versus liars. They, they touched on politics briefly. And it was it was uh, 
it, it, it was very it was very engaging. So you know, Bitcoin advocacy is an important level or is an important conversation that we need to be having at every level. Here in Ken, in Kansas, Dennis, we have um, uh, we have Kansas Senator um, or U.S. Senator from Kansas, uh, Dr. Roger Marshall, and um, he's co-sponsored you know legislation that you know appearing to be bipartisan with uh, uh, with Senator Elizabeth Warren, and I feel like they're completely on the wrong side of Bitcoin. Um, uh, working currently with Kyle Schweppes, uh, head of public policy for Foundry, um, to help arrange a good number of Kansas Bitcoin mining executives. You might not know it, but there's there's you know a half a dozen Bitcoin mining executives who are Kansas residents. We're trying to arrange a conversation with Senator Marshall so that we can just simply share, hey, we're your constituents. We've built businesses. We have. We're creating jobs. We have a different perspective. You don't need to be listening to the you know the ecosystem. Uh, any insight, you know, so not necessarily, you know, going after Senator Marshall, but if you are in that position, you're a leader of a Bitcoin mining company, your senator or congressman's on the on the wrong side. How, you know, how do you take the steps in order to get your message heard in front of them? I don't think there's any real like singular path to getting someone to come back from being on the wrong side of an issue. Um you generally, when, when things have devolved to that level where your elected official is opposed to the issue that you care about, it, you, you need to be willing to pursue a variety of different approaches. And some of them are, most of them, and I think that the things that we should start with definitely revolve around education and in-person meetings. And then I think also you want to look towards you know, groups that they value or people that they, they trust and that they, um, you know, believe are leaders in a space and, and have them, you know, and educate those people and then have that person sort of be an influence on that person. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that that can be done. Everything from, you know, convincing their favorite think tank or nonprofit to be pro Bitcoin to their favorite politician, you know, the impact of, of someone like Trump being pro Bitcoin could impact a lot of people in this country, or the impact of uh, the Biden administration turning to the positive side, which we've seen a lot of uh, rumors and sort of murmurs about out there in the in the uh, in the ether, so to speak. You know, those shifts, those big shifts, those big changes, those that definitely impacts people. Um, additional, additional to that, and aside is there's like that more aggressive side of politics, right? Like, to, there are eventually times when you realize that there's nothing that can be done and that the only way to get uh, the result that you need, the only way to get your representative to hear you and to pay attention to you is potentially to replace them or to, um, you know, fund their opponent's political campaign or to um, launch a think tank, which starts to educate all the lawmakers around them. And so there's this like level of influence, you know, it, it's not usually where you want to go, but like, for instance, look at what's happening with Senator Warren, uh, now she has a strong uh, Senate camp, Senate opposition for her position there in in Massachusetts, purely because of the fact that she's so anti crypto, right? Like we we're, we're not going to convince Senator Warren. Everybody's tried, and she won't take meetings even with um, Bitcoin and crypto people. So mm. what do you do when no one when when, you, when they won't listen? Well, fortunately in the United States, this is not true necessarily in every country, uh, but fortunately in the United States we have a system for that. It's called elections. Right. So if someone is not listening to you and they are pressing you and they are putting you in a bad position um, and discriminating against you as an industry, then you can hope to have someone who will listen to you and who will pay attention to you um, to replace them. And that way you can be able to show if you're able to do that as well. I think that's a strong signal to the rest of the lawmakers out there. Like, you know, we aren't just going to sit here and take it. You know, we are going to find ways to unseat you if you are going to target and discriminate us as an industry and us as individuals. I just want to tip my hat to you because that, that was, you know, really, you know, I, I know it wasn't a question we certainly discussed in advance and um, you actually gave me some meaningful insight there. Um, but what I, I realized in this is that you're a man of action. Like I can ask a question and I can have all the enthusiasm in the world, but then I get bogged down five kids at home and a full-time job, right? You are actually doing the work. So I just want to tip my hat, my, my hat to you. And I want to encourage anyone who's listening to, you know, connect with you and to use your blueprint from Satoshi Action Fund and to, you know, engage with with with, with your team if they need advocacy on a 
on a state by state basis. So thank you. I, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to talk about Mining Disrupt. I am, I am super excited to be at Mining Disrupt. We're going to have a booth there. We're bringing a large team. I think we're bringing nine people. It's our, our first time to be out with a, a booth at a conference in quite some time. Dennis, you're you're the official MC of that entire conference. I've seen you there. Is there is there anything that you'd like to share to the mining community or you know the the pleb miner about mining disrupt? Can you give us a highlight about this exciting conference that we're going to be attending next week? Yeah, I couldn't be more excited to work with the mining disrupt team. We've got we've really built a great relationship with them. Uh, it all started last year when I came on as the official MC for the first time, and I was also able to secure RFK as a speaker for that that conference. And so that went really well. And so we just you know we had a great conversation in the off season, and we said you know let's do let's do even more for year two. So I'll be the MC. I'm also helping design some of the content, and um, it's been great. They've been you know um, the the owners of that organization have just been so supportive of of what I'm trying to accomplish. And they really love that I'm coming alongside and helping with the content. And I, I'm feeling very confident about that conference as a whole. And this is just the beginning. I think for year three, when I come back, we're going to do a whole lot more. And so uh, year two with them is going to be exciting. We've got Senator Cruz coming to speak. He's going to be interviewed on a fireside chat with by Fred Thiel uh, from Marathon. So, you know, of course, the whole Marathon team is going to be there as well. Uh, we really were excited to see them come back. Um, they were not there last year, but they're coming back this year. And so uh, it's just a ton of different content pieces that I'm, I'm, I'm pumped are going to be taking place from everything from the Senator Cruz. So we have an energy debate. So we're going to be having uh, four different gentlemen, Troy Cross, Adam O, uh, Colin McLean, and, and, and Ali from Terra Verde, uh, get up there on stage and debate green energy versus, versus hydrocarbons, fossil fuels, right? So that should be a really great piece of content. Um, we've also have a number of other pieces of content that we've worked through that um, I think are going to be very, very successful. And in fact, we're including an AI panel for the first time in the uh, the Bitcoin space. Not, it might not be Bitcoin mining, but there's just so many miners that are like, you know, sh the premise is like, should we AI or not, right? Because they're all being asked if they're going to. And there's a large chunk, I would say, about half of the miners who really are diving into the AI, AI space. So that'll be an, an exciting piece of content. I think the biggest thing to keep in mind about Mining Disrupt is, is that – it is a. Uh, it started off very business to business. They've done such a great job building that environment, that ecosystem of of sponsors that want to come in and show their products and have other miners come in and take a look at those products. A lot of a lot of deals and handshakes. So if you're in the mining space, I mean, you, you know, there really is not a better place in the Bitcoin mining world to go meet the most important people in the Bitcoin mining industry, and then also, um, you know, have, make deals, get, get have deals happen. Right, the handshakes happen all the time there. Uh, and now, though, we're in addition to that, in addition to that environment, we're going to be expanding the content. So it's a little more exciting for maybe the person who is just getting into Bitcoin mining or maybe they're just getting into Bitcoin. Um, they don't, they're not there necessarily for the B2B experience, but they want to see the various products and offerings that these companies have and, and also have a, have a great time you know, listening to fantastic speakers and, and having great content presented to them. So really excited. It's a breakout year. They, have got, they broke records on sponsorships. They broke records on media partners. And, you know, we're on our, on our way to break our record with the, uh, the ticket sales as well. So um, mm. if you ever, anyone wants to go, they can use code Satoshi and uh, you can get 20% off your tickets. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you there, Curtis, and uh, the rest of the Compass team as well. Yeah, it's not too late. The conference starts on Tuesday. I guess there's an opening night party on Monday night. Um, uh, and this podcast is going to come out on Monday. So uh, you said one more time that the, the code for 20% off as uh, code Satoshi. Yep, you can use code Satoshi for Satoshi Action. You know, you can use that and you get 20% off any ticket. So I know a lot of people buy their tickets last minute. So hopefully some folks will see this uh, and save themselves 20%. Dennis, just as you as you were speaking about that, I just really feel your passion for this particular conference. I mean, you you were you were tripping expertise over it, and you're you're exactly right. You know, we're obviously in the mining industry. We're incredibly excited to be there. It does seem to bring the entire mining industry together. I'll make one more one more comment though. Um, you you talked about Senator Cruz and um, and Fred Thiel from Marathon being together. Here's another example where it sounds like you've arranged um, a, a major voice in the Bitcoin mining space to be, uh, you know, across the across the table from an influential uh, senator. I think Senator Cruz is already orange pilled. I, um, I I'm very excited to to hear from them. And and you also mentioned the energy debate. I don't know if you did also, but 
I heard from my friend Justin Orkey yesterday. I think he's hoping to to crash the party. He wants to be on that energy on that energy debate stage. Um, uh, several of the names you named are just influential leaders. You know, Adam uh, obviously was one of the biggest voices I was paying attention to in oil and gas before I really found mining. But Troy Cross is uh, is is phenomenal. So uh, thank you, thank you for all of that. Now, I, I, you know, I think we're you know getting close to closing. I got a couple more uh, uh, things to to try to get your insight on. But on uh, Tuesday night of the conference, Satoshi Action Fund is hosting a fundraiser. Uh, I'm coming to it. I know that. I am super excited about it. It's not too late for people. I don't know. I think sponsorships are sold out. But would you would you give a high level about what uh, that event is that you're hosting on Tuesday night in Miami? Definitely. Uh, and we're going to be pumped to have you there as well as, uh, you know, and th thank you for, for sponsoring the event. We're looking forward to having you on the boat and uh, the rest of the team and the rest of the sponsors. So uh, last year was our first year. What we do is we do um, the poker on a boat, uh, food, drinks, cigars. It's an incredibly powerful networking opportunity. You know, many of the, many of the top people in the space come on board. I mean, that's I am able to really utilize my um, my network, my Rolodex to, to get people to come and participate. And uh, we have a great time. You know, last year we had 150 people. This year we're, I mean, we're at that amount right now, pretty much. And uh, we're looking at getting about 200, maybe 225, which would break our record for the boat from last year. And, you know, last year the boat was, pre was pretty full. Um, so it's going to be a packed house for sure and a, and a great opportunity to connect. And then uh, on top of that, you know, all of the proceeds, all the profit after everything is said and done, that goes to support the work of defending Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining here in the United States and to make sure that the United States is the best place in the world to be a Bitcoiner. So not, not only are you uh, having a fantastic time at one of the best events of the entire year. In fact, we say it's the, the abs we say we put on the best side events of any team in the entire space. And so, um, uh, you know, not only are you going to have a fantastic time, but you, you, all that money goes to supporting a good cause as well. Can, can we pull on that thread a little bit? Um, so I, you know, when I think of, you know, myself and my old life, I'm, you know, you know, one income family or at home. I'm not sure, you know, how often I'm writing a check to Satoshi Action Fund, you know, maybe after I've been through a couple cycles and I've got, you know, I can start to be be benevolent. But the existing Bitcoin ecosystem, specifically who we, you know, have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, you know, connect connectivity with is the existing mining industry. What is the is the mining industry supporting your work financially well enough? Do we need to be doing a better job? How can the existing Bitcoin mining industry, you know, contribute more? Do you do you need large donations? Do you need monthly donations? Do you need to be, you know, included in their mailing list or podcast or newsletters? How can the existing Bitcoin mining industry support Satoshi Action Fund and your amazing work? That's a great question as well, Curtis. Um, you know, we certainly do need more support. We do get a lot of support for the Bitcoin miners. You know, we just had uh, a couple different miners, you know, renew their support for us. And so, you know, we got some support last year and uh, we were able to renew a couple of those already. So we're looking forward to continuing to fight to protect Bitcoin mining and in the U.S. and gaining that support. Um, as a note, too, we're about to bring on a new director of development. Um, we've never had a director of development, so it's just been Dennis doing all that work. Uh, but we're going to be bringing on a director of development and then launching, relaunching our offering. So if you're in the Bitcoin mining space and you're interested in the work that we're doing, but you want to see a little bit more of that bilateral relationship or a little bit more connection and um, integration into the work that we have to offer, um, that's what, something that we're going to be doing. We're going to be re totally relaunching our benefits packages coming up. So not only will you be able to support our good work, um, but there's opportunities for you to you know, gain insights. You know, we have very powerful bill tracking software. Um, we have the ability to give you, you know, access to exclusive events, whether that be meeting with lawmakers or, or you know, potentially speaking alongside lawmakers as well. So tons of opportunities that are going to be presented. We're still working through what the offerings are going to be, but I would expect those will be launched uh, around mid-July. Uh, so we can, we're going to get to work right away. Uh, sh going out and sh going on the road and sharing with everybody what those opportunities are. I I hope that you will um, give that new development director my information. I think that I'm going to be an easy yes. I'm a huge advocate of uh, of the work you're doing, and I look forward to finding ways for Compass to be to be more supportive. That's just that's just incredible. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much, Dennis. Um, as I, as I led with, you, you've become a close friend. I, I value you and your contribution to um, Bitcoin mining so much. And for you to take the time to come in here today and to talk to me just really means a lot. 
Um, you mentioned your DMs being open on Twitter. I don't know how that is. I think you have 160,000 or more followers. Um, be, because of this you know, social media and content driven world that we live in, I know our audience is going to want a chance to connect with you more. You mentioned your website before, but would you, you know, in closing, and it's a common question for, from, from podcasts, but uh, how, how do people find you? Where do you want them to look for more? Uh, thank you for having me on and I'm happy to share more about how people can connect with me. Uh, so if, on Twitter, it's Dennis uh, underscore Porter underscore is my username. And then um, you can f also reach out to us via email, help at satoshiaction.io, or you can go to our website, satoshiaction.io. We have different resources there and, and a way for people to connect with us as well. Um, yeah, people should reach out if you have an interest in what we're doing. We certainly are, are open to learning more about how we can help the Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining industry be successful in the U.S. and happy to share how we're able to accomplish that on a deeper level. Because of your reach and audience, it won't surprise me if this uh, if this podcast episode gets uh, you know chopped and clipped and uh, promoted larger. So if you're watching or listening to this and you're not already subscribed to Compass Mining, I hope you'll you know track us down. We do try to bring forward purposeful, meaningful conversations that educate the Bitcoin mining ecosystem. Dennis, I look forward to seeing you in Miami next week. Thank you so much for joining me today. Curtis is a pleasure and uh, really pumped for the for the boat. And thank you again for your support. Looking forward to having a great time. Yes, sir.